And he's speaking about us. And he wants to be prepared for us to receive the sealing of the living God. Because my God is not in a tomb. He is resurrected. And he works in three persons. God, my father, who loves me so much that he gave his son, God made human. So that he can show that he can relate to me whenever I am tempted. And become a role model for me to understand that I can become a victorious individual. And also a useful person, a servant of the Lord. How does make, Satan make war with us? Well, number one, he first, the first one is obvious. Through pain and, and heartbreak. Until one can barely take a deep breath. Satan is an expert at giving us troubles emotionally, spiritually, <coughs> within the home. And sometimes we wonder, Lord, are you there? Do you realize that I'm going through pain? But then we, we understand, okay, it feels that way. I'm being tested. I understand this. I'm going to kneel down. We kneel down. And in the midst of the darkness of the worst trials of our lives, we learn, I can depend on Jesus. He's going to be with me. He is with me. And we continue on. And when Satan says that he is not really making us crumble, then he changes his strategy. And he says, forget the law. You are under grace. The law was abolished at the cross. It's not important anymore. And millions of people are falling there. And then he goes and says, Exalt the law as being so high above human attainment that no man or woman can keep the law. And then some other million people fall in there. And some Seventh-day Adventists also fall in that type of temptation. We believe it. When we uh, turn on our, our TVs and watch programs that are not supposed to be watched on the Sabbath day of the Lord or on Wednesday or Thursday or any other day. And then Satan comes with another strategy. The compromising of sin. You can't keep the commandments because you, are, you were born sinner. It's okay, you can sin once in a while. And you can continue like this. He's merciful, he's understanding, he, he will save you anyway. Option four. It's very enticing to others. You shouldn't, shouldn't try to keep the commandments, because if you do, you will be a legalist. Huh? Have you heard that on TV? What they are preaching? No, the Seventh-day Adventist people are legalists. The, the, the Ten Commandments were nailed at the cross. They are legalists. And then you are afraid and maybe ashamed of saying that you are a Seventh-day Adventist because you're supposed to be a different people. And then the option five says the commandment is not only the Ten Commandments. There is a commandment. Go and preach this gospel to all nations. This doesn't apply to me. I don't have too many talents anyways. I don't speak English very well. I mispronounce some words. I can just sit down and, and, and enjoy seeing others singing. Because anyway, I don't have that many talents. Why does Satan hate the law so much? And by the way, by this time, you understand where the battle is, right? <coughs> Satan opposed Jesus Christ in heaven. He didn't like his character. He attacked directly that that represents. It's like a picture of Jesus' character, the law. He came to Adam and Eve and did the same thing. He tried to destroy Jesus Christ. He hated the law. Which law? The law that applies in two basic universal principles. Love your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you haven't learned how to love yourself, that's the first step. In order to love others, I have to learn to love myself. And I learned that through the ABC of the gospel. Jesus Christ gave his life so that I can be saved. So I am so precious in the sight of the Lord that he gave his life for me. I am not talking about cold theology, but living truth. I am not as interested in extreme or extremely rigid, cold conformity motivated by either fear of God or hope of reward. Such concerns are not the burdens of the law. That is not the gospel. The gospel that seals does not generate rebellion by the so-called liberals or pride in the so-called conservatives. The gospel that seals is simply, simply produces people who say with joy, great peace have those who love thy commandment. Nothing can make him stumble. Or I will run in the way of your commandments. When you enlarge, enlargest my understanding, the understanding of the everlasting gospel. I am talking about the gospel that the apostles preached. It either produced riot or revival, never boredom or hoham. It met and solved the same human problems that perplex psychiatrists and social scientists are facing today. Look what happened in Corinth. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revivals, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Were some of you. Past sentence. But you're not. But you were washed out. But you were sanctified. But you were sacked. Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The gospel that changes people and makes them into victorious people. The gospel that seals with the sealing of the living God is the story of Jesus. From his birth to the awful focus of Calvary. It did something for people and it will do the same for people today. For your neighbors and your cousins and your fathers and mothers who are not sitting in this church today. And what did they hear? <coughs> what did they hear? <coughs> well, some of you were given testimonies today. And I like that part of your worship service. Because you are saying in the midst of trials and difficulties, in the midst of sickness, and in the midst of happiness and blessings, we want to walk with Jesus. But they heard that God loved them and died for them long before they made any moves towards Him. See, it's not that we go to God. God comes to us first. And then He convinces and convicts us of sin. And then He, he creates this emptiness. Then we realize, I need God in my heart. He is moving all the time for us to move after. They heard that God took the risk of becoming a man. Subject to all the weaknesses and perils common to any child of humanity. Subject to the possibility of being completely separated eternally from his father. That was the greatest fear that Jesus Christ had when he was pending there on the cross. They heard of a God who suffered and died in their place. They heard of a God who conquered all of life's temptations by faith. Not by some kind of a special inside help that the rest of humanity doesn't have. They heard that.